Uh, it's, uh, it's, I don't know, it's, it's marvelous to be led in worship uh, by people like Darren and Nestor and, and the rest of the team that comes up here every Sunday to draw us, to draw our hearts into that sense of experiencing God and experiencing His presence. I love it. I love it. So thank you. Thank you for bringing us into His presence this morning. Uh, obviously, uh, I am not Ty Cross, because he's right over there. Uh, and for those of you that don't know me, my name is Damon Deering, and I am the pastor of youth ministry here at Fellowship Bible Church. Uh, Ty will be back in a couple weeks, jumping back into the book of John, uh, that series that we've been going through this year. Uh, he'll be picking up in John 13, uh, that passage that uh, is commonly referred to as the upper room discourse, and we find that Jesus and his friends, his disciples, have re-entered the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, and uh, they're, they gather in an upper room, uh, an upstairs floor of a house, uh, to celebrate that meal, the Passover meal. And we will find, uh, when Pastor Ty comes with that message in a couple of weeks, uh, that Jesus does something while they're serving the meal uh, in that upper room that is remarkable. And when we, we understand the, the context, the historical context and the cultural context of what he does, we're going to be challenged and we're going to be amazed. He washes his disciples' feet. He takes off his outer garment, puts a towel around his waist, and bends down and begins to wash his disciples' feet. And the, the meaning behind that and the humility behind that and the power behind that act of service is tremendous. And so in anticipation of that, as, as, I, as I thought through what is coming in a couple of weeks with that message, I asked myself some questions and I, I asked myself, where do I, where do I begin uh, to get to that point where I can say, yeah, I, I can do that? Because in that passage, Christ himself says, I've given you an example. I've given you something for you to do as well. Just as I've done it, you go and you do it also. All right. All right, Jesus. How do I get to that point, though? How do I prepare myself for such an act of service? And that led me uh, to our passage this morning, Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. And that's going to be our focus this morning, so if you have a Bible, I would ask that you open that up. Uh, grab your device and open your favorite Bible app with the device silenced. Uh, but we'll be reading from Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. And thinking through in this passage, uh, what is the life of Paul presenting to us? So if you found that, please follow along as I read Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Paul stating, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this passage. I thank you for the exhortation we find in this passage. I thank you for even the example that Paul lends to us in this passage. And I ask that you would speak to us uh, through the words that we read, through the verses that we will consider this morning. I ask that you would open this scripture up to us, that our minds would be clear, that our eyes would be able to see, that our ears would be able to hear, Lord, what you are asking of us this morning. And I thank you for that. In Christ's name, amen. Life of Paul is, is presented to us here. And I find in this passage, thinking about being prepared to serve, thinking about uh, what we'll be jumping into uh, when, when we jump back into the book of John. 
three characteristics here. I see three traits of a servant of Christ that Paul is presenting from his own life. If you are a servant of Christ, you are, one, you're imperfect. If you're a servant of Christ, in this passage I find that, two, we're present. And thirdly, if you are a servant of Christ, you are purposeful. You are purposeful. So let's dig in a little bit further into this. Uh, Paul starts off right off the bat uh, with the fact that he is not perfect. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect. And then down in verse 13, brothers, I do not, my, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. He is not yet perfect. He is imperfect. He has not met that standard that he's holding before himself. And it's interesting because Earlier in this passage, he's laying out what we might consider the qualities of someone who was perfect when he lays out who he was as a Pharisee. And these are perfections in his life that existed because of standards that the world had for him. In the eyes of his world, perhaps, he had the confidence to say that he had made it. He had attained what he should have attained. The world does have standards, though, and standards that... Uh, affect us whether we believe it or not. Uh, and when we, we view ourselves in light of those standards, what happens? Well, we fail. We fail. I think a good example uh, to think about these standards is what happened this morning. We woke up, we got out of bed, went to the bathroom, looked in the mirror, and what do we see? Do we see perfection? Now, I know maybe some of you did. Some of you did, but for most of us in this room, we saw something that needed to be changed. We saw something that needed to be fixed. And most of us are there at that point. I see my friend Rob in the back, and I know that he didn't see anything that needed to be changed. Uh, in fact, I was with him earlier this week at the gym. Um, with him, I was struggling on the treadmill, look over, and uh, I see Rob slowly lifting weights over by the rack. Distracting when you see perfection presented <laughs> before you. Distracting. I almost fell off the treadmill. Three times. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. But in all seriousness, we struggle with that because there are standards that are placed on our lives from the world's perspective. We have advertisements. We can't miss the billboards as we drive down the freeway. We have commercials while we watch our favorite TV show. We go to movies and we know that Hollywood's presenting a standard that's, that's being asked of us to attain, to live by. And a, a big one, and one that's becoming more and more large in our lives, is those same standards as we find in social media. In fact, I've been doing some, some reading on social media lately. In the last few years, a lot of research has been done regarding social media use by large universities. I read a study out of Stanford. I read a study out of the University of Pennsylvania. And these studies are proving that there is a direct corollary between the amount of social media use and the level of depression in a person's life. And that mental illness is becoming greater and greater in our society. And it's not just affecting adults, and those studies at first focus on adults, but guess what? And this is closer to my heart as a youth pastor, it's affecting teens enormously that the level of mental illness experienced by teenagers today is off the charts compared with previous generations. And studies are showing that it's because of their involvement in social media. It's a standard. We see something that we cannot obtain. On Facebook, you don't post the bad and the ugly stuff. You post what you want people to see. You post what you want people to think of your life. You see that billboard, it's something that someone wants you to believe in. 
that this is what life should be like. And when you compare yourself, guess what? Yeah, you don't measure up. You're imperfect. You're imperfect. But we here this morning know that it doesn't stop at the external. It goes a little bit further. Uh, from God's word, we read things like uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, when God has asked Samuel to go choose a new king because King Saul blew it, right? And so we find Samuel with the family of Jesse, and, and he sees uh, Jesse's oldest son and just automatically thinks, this is the king. This guy's got to be the king. He's got it all. Look at him. But how's God, how does God respond to that? God says, whoa, 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 Samuel. No, 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 no. You're just looking at the outside. I don't look at the external. I look at what's on the inside. I look at the heart. God looks at the heart. A parallel to that idea in the book of Matthew, Jesus himself, uh, when he's talking to the Pharisees, uh, Matthew 23, verse 27, he refers to the Pharisees as whitewashed tombs. Yeah, they look really good on the outside. They got it. They look fantastic. But what's on the inside? Again, God is concerned with where their hearts are at. And what's on the inside of a tomb? Nothing pleasant. Nothing nice. Ugliness. Death. God has standards, doesn't he? And guess what? We fail those as well. So pretty much we're failures, aren't we? We, we miss out on the world's standards. We miss out on God's standards. We read verses like Isaiah 53, 6. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us, each of us has turned to his own way. Passages like, like Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We miss God's standard. And we can't escape that. We can't get away from it. And this is where Paul finds himself. And he finds himself lacking. He once led a life where he might have believed, I've got it. I've got it. But as he came to know Christ, as he came to know Jesus personally in his life, he realized that he was missing out on the standard that God himself had given him. And we find ourselves in the same boat. And in the context of this chapter in Philippians, we understand that uh, Paul is looking toward the resurrection, isn't he? That's the moment where perfection will be attained. That is what he's striving for to live a life until that resurrection takes place, where the corruption of his body will no longer be an issue. And the reality will be that he will be perfect. But he's not perfect yet. And we are not perfect yet. That leads us to our second point. If you are a servant of Christ, you are present. You're here. To be present really means to, to live in the here and the now. Paul states, uh, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. He, he's forgetting that past that he once held very close, very dear. He stopped living in the past, and we need to do so also. We need to let go of our past. Because sometimes there's failure in our past. And and we can get to the point where we assume that failure is going to happen again. We assume that maybe failure is just who I am. And when that happens, that distorts our view of life right now. We're always living in the fear that failure is going to take place. We need to leave that behind. But it's not just failure in our past, it's also success in our past. Maybe we've had great success. What's the assumption there? Just like we might assume that failure will continue, if we've had great success, we might assume that that success is going to be repeated. But what happens if it doesn't? What happens if that level of success that we attained never materializes again? Sometimes we lose hope. Sometimes Fear controls us all the same, just as if we had failed. 
and we get disillusioned and we fail, we fail to live in the present because we're always looking back for that to be repeated. It's not just the past that we need to let go of, however. Now, here in this passage, Paul states that he's straining toward what is ahead. And we understand from this passage that he's straining towards the resurrection. Okay? And that's, that's not what I'm saying we need to let go of. What I'm talking about is our personal future. That elusive American dream, if you will, of getting that high-paying job, of uh, procuring a powerful position at our job or within our community, of building this massive 401k, dreams of early retirement and buying that vacation house in Italy. Yeah, these dreams can control us. This focus on our personal future can take our eyes off what is happening right now just as much as our focus on the past can. And we need to let go of that. Focusing on our future, our personal future, without bringing into the reality of eternity, it's all about me and me and me. And the more it becomes about me, the less it becomes about God, doesn't it? The less it becomes about what's happening right now in our lives in terms of what God is doing and how God is at work. Both of these viewpoints, having an undue focus on either our past or our personal future, can remove us from what is right in front of our eyes. Paul forgets what lies behind, strains toward that eternity, that hope that he has for living in the presence of his God, living with Jesus and being made perfect. And that affects the life that he lives in the present. I found a great passage that helps us understand this in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 through 19. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Oh, what a beautiful picture that God provides us for that eventuality of our future in eternity. Another passage uh, that I thought of in, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, a passage that many of us might be familiar with, where Jesus exhorts us to not store up treasures on this earth, to not give focus to the, the possibility of our future and what our future while on this earth might look like. Why? Because malls can come in and eat our suits, which they've done. I didn't think that was a thing until it happened to me. Rust destroys. Thieves break in and they steal. What we attain on this earth is, is going to burn. It doesn't last. What does Christ ask us to do? Focus on what's coming next. Focused on that eternal perspective. That's where you need to store up treasure. Why? Because that's where your heart needs to be. Remember, God's looking at the heart. God's looking at what's on the inside. He says where your treasure is, guess what? That's where your heart is. That's where your heart is. We also, as servants of Christ, need to be purposeful. We're imperfect. That's obvious. That's obvious. And God uses the weak, we find in Scripture. We need to be present. We need to live right now, right here, and experience the work of God instead of focusing on the past, instead of focusing on the future. But we also need to be purposeful. Uh, Paul ends our passage with the phrase, I press on toward the goal. I press on toward the goal to win the prize. This is language that we're used to when we read through Paul's letters. This analogy of sports, uh, comparing the idea of sports and training for sports to the Christian life. And he's using similar language here. He's straining. He's pressing on. He wants to win that prize. He wants to cross 
that finish line. A similar passage uh, that opens up some more of this idea that Paul is expressing here is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, where Paul says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, that means listen to this. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man just beating the air. No. I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. It's about purpose. The sports analogy for us is easy to understand. Finding purpose in that analogy is easy for us to understand because we're, we're surrounded by, we're literally surrounded by sports in our culture. Even if uh, sitting here this morning, you, you're not a pro athlete, uh, you're an amateur, you're a dabbler in sports, whether it's board games or pickup basketball games. You understand what it takes to be good what it takes to be good enough even to win. And in doing so, in order to win, we need to be purposeful because it takes effort, because it takes strategy, because it takes resources. Giftedness only gets us so far in these terms. It takes effort in order to win. Why do we need to be purposeful? Uh, an important thing that I I think Paul lays out for us is because God has actually given us purpose. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Each of us that have taken the name of Christ upon us, each of us that have confessed Christ as Lord and Savior, have been given purpose, have been presented with this upward call of God to a life that's more than the life that the world would have us to live. It's found in knowing Christ, which we read previously in this chapter, chapter 3. Paul wants to know Christ in every area, in every circumstance. He wants to know Christ more and more and more. Guess what? We need to know Christ. We need to know Christ. That is a purpose for our lives. We also need to share Christ in 1 Corinthians 9, which we just read earlier in that passage, Paul makes the statement, I become all things to all men. Why? In order that some might be saved. In order that some might come to that same saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ that I myself have come to. It doesn't stop at just knowing who Jesus is. It means sharing that knowledge with others that more might know that same Messiah that you and I know. It also means that there is good work in our lives for us to do. We have purpose. Uh, in Ephesians 2.10, uh, maybe not as familiar passage as 2.8 and 9 uh, that many of us might know. Um, that's, it's like the forgotten child of Ephesians 2. Uh, but this passage, or this verse, talks about how we are God's workmanship created to do good works. That is purpose in your life. Do you want to know the will of God for your life? Read Ephesians 2.10. You're God's workmanship, and he created you to do good stuff. And that good stuff, those good works, guess what? He prepared in advance for you to do. He saw what you were going to do. He meant for you to do certain things, and he prepared that stuff for you to do. And he wants you, he asks you to do it. And then we read a passage like James 4.17, and this is a passage that honestly kind of scares me. When you turn to it and read it, you find that James says, you know what? Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff to do out there. But if you don't do it, if you see something that's right to do and you don't do it, you sin. <laughs> what? You sin. 
If there is something in front of you that you know you probably should do, that you have the capacity to do, that you know is the right thing, that it's good to do, and you fail to do it, James calls you out on it and says, you're sinning. Yeah, we're imperfect. We fail again. We fail again, but we have purpose. And because we have purpose, we need to be purposeful. The ultimate goal that Paul's talking about here is, of course, the resurrection. The ultimate goal is experiencing perfection because of that resurrection. And you and I, by faith in Christ, will experience that same perfection someday. But until then, we've got purpose. And God uses our perfection in that purpose. God uses our presence in the here and now to fulfill that purpose. That's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. If you are a servant of Christ, you are imperfect. Your identity needs to come from Jesus himself. It can't come from the standards that the world imposes on you. It simply can't. But in doing so, in finding your identity in Christ, God's going to use you. God's going to use you. We need to be present if we are servants of Christ, not living in the past, not sacrificing our lives and our families for some unknown future that we would like to have, but seeing God at work around us and engaging him in that work, that good work. Guess what? That he's prepared in advance for us to do. If he's prepared that work, he's also prepared us and given us the ability, the courage, the enablement fulfill that work. We also need to be purposeful. If you are a servant of Christ, you need to be purposeful in your life. Simply do what God asks you to do. Guess what? We have his word right here. We can read what he wants us to do, how he wants us to live our lives. Do what he says. Simply do what he says. Live a life of spiritual discipline like an athlete lives a life of discipline, and be purposeful. I leave you this morning with an exhortation in the book of Psalms. Uh, Psalm 37, verses 1 through 6. Do not fret. Oop, wrong psalm. No, that was the right psalm. Psalm 37, verses 1 through 6. Do not fret because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. That's what I want to experience. And I trust and pray that's what your desire is as well. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this word in Philippians. I thank you for your leading and your guidance in our lives. Lord, we understand that we are imperfect, but we also understand that You use the weak to confound the strong. You use uh, the lowly to confound the wise. We want to be used by you. We desire to be present in this world and not focused on something that is going to remove ourselves from the work and the purpose that you have set before us. So I ask you to help us in this, Lord, that we might be prepared to serve, that when we are challenged with the example that Christ himself gave us in John 13, we would be ready and we would be willing and we ourselves would say, here am I, Lord, send me. In Christ's name I pray, amen.